Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. You might have seen me show this off briefly in the past, but today we're going to be looking at this desktop system right here. Now I have already done a little bit of rooting around inside, but I think this PC still qualifies as being in the same condition as it was when I bought it. That includes all the post-it notes and price tags. I really hope that a major part of this channel can be about upgrading and testing pre-built PCs such as this one, so I'm excited for this to be my first. I'll tell you now that I got this system for just $10, but that won't mean much until we take a look at what this system has to offer. So to start, let's take a look at the case from the front, where we have a pleasing exterior design from manufacturer HP. I'm not actually a huge fan of this case, as it's a bit light and flimsy for my tastes, but it gets the job done. Now thankfully we don't have a whole lot to do to figure out what this system is actually packing, as turning right around to the side of the case shows us one of the reasons I have a lot of fun upgrading HP pre-builds. It's a neat little sticker that tells us everything we need to know. No disassembly required. This desktop PC is an HP Pavilion P6310Y. That's not much to go on, but it does tell us we have a Pavilion, which is HP's consumer branded answer to the likes of Dell's Inspiron and XPS lineups. We also see what CPU and memory the system has in it. For the CPU, we have an AMD Athlon 2 X4 630. This is a quad-core processor clocked at 2.8GHz based on the 45 nanometer Propus architecture. It's based on the AM3 socket, which makes it compatible with many Phenom 2 processors. I may test one of these in the future. At a glance, the CPU looks comparable to the Core 2 Quad Q9505 that I've reviewed in the past. From previous benchmarks, we've seen that CPU has decent gaming performance for budget shoppers, so I look forward to seeing what we have here. And we also get a neat 6GB of DDR3 RAM inside the package. Of course, all of this assumes nothing about the system was changed before I got my hands on it. On the back, we have an underwhelming assortment of I.O., including four USB ports, an Ethernet port, VGA, DVI, and even Firewire. Even for a pre-built such as this one, that I.O. is sort of lacking, but it should be enough to get us by. So, now that we've looked outside the case, let's have a look at the inside. Pre-built desktop manufacturers don't always have to worry about making their systems look super nice, unlike what consumers do when they build PCs on their own. That's why we get this really great, not at all intrusive set of cables moving in front of all the relevant system parts. That includes the power supply cables, but also these cables coming from the front I.O. There's actually a good reason for why the case looks like this. That motherboard was not specifically designed for this case. In fact, the M2N78LA line of motherboards is a whole host of boards, with each being produced to meet the needs of system integrators. This motherboard is the Violet 6 model, which is notable for having a full 4 DIMM slots and integrated NVIDIA graphics built right into the chipset. And there's our 6GB of RAM hidden behind a bunch of PSU cables. We appear to have one second-gen PCI Express 16X slot, which should be perfect for graphics cards upgrades. In addition, there are some PCIe 1X slots, as well as a basic PCI slot for compatibility. Finally, we have a stock AMD heatsink. Nothing crazy fancy here. I actually dislike these heatsinks a lot, because they're so dang difficult to remove. So instead, we're going to verify that the CPU inside is the one we expect by instead booting into Ubuntu and checking the system specs. And it looks like we have exactly what we're looking for. The OS also detects all 6GB of RAM, which means we've got a nice, clean slate for system upgrading. Oh yeah, that's right! I think at this point it's time to start upgrading our system. While the system does come with integrated graphics, I think it'll be best for us to add a graphics card so that we can get the most gaming performance possible out of it. Here's a GTX 1050. No, here's a GTX 1050. This basic Zotac Amp Edition model has no bells or whistles, but it's actually really well built for the price. At just $75 on eBay, this graphics card was quite the steal. I want to quickly go off topic and note the notch and solder patches here on the PCB. It's possible that Zotac used this PCB for other GPUs than just the 1050. Given that there are six connectors here, I'm thinking it might be used for a GTX 1060, though whether it's a 6GB or a 3GB model, I wouldn't be sure. Anyway, inserting this graphics card is a piece of cake. And thankfully, because we have a single slot card, we don't have to punch out any of these PCI slot covers. This is one of those reasons why I dislike this style of case, but thankfully we don't have to be punching anything out today. Now that we've got our GPU in there, this thing is starting to look a little more capable as a gaming system. But there's something we still need to add here. That would be the storage. Here I have a Toshiba 7200 RPM 1TB hard drive. I actually bought this component brand new at my local micro center, and my reasoning for this is that I intend to use this drive for future projects. But for just $37, we're still getting a decent deal. I think this helps to offset the unusually good deal we got on the actual PC, considering you can probably go out and find a used hard drive for a fraction of the price I paid on mine. 
And here's our complete system, ready to go. For just $122, we have a quad-core processor and a decent GPU that together should be able to get a lot done. So, how does it game? Before we get into that, I want to discuss these Windows keys you sometimes find on pre-built systems. As long as the motherboard inside the PC is the same one it originally shipped with, then you can use this product key to get an install of Windows on any hard drive you put in it. That means that, if you were to buy these parts as I did and you need an OS, you could install Windows 7 on it. Though it's important to keep in mind that Windows 7 support will be ending within a year from now, and Windows 7 does not have support for the DirectX 12 API, that means that some of the very latest games may have trouble running, or will not run entirely on your system if you choose to use it. That said, I don't intend to install Windows 7 myself, as I'll be using my tried-and-true Windows 8.1 SSD, along with this hard drive for storing my Steam games library. Just keep in mind, though, that if you're doing this yourself, you have the option of installing Windows 7 if you can get the ISO. No product key required. Now we're ready to do some benchmarks and see how this $120 gaming PC performs. Well, we would be, but at this point we encountered a problem. A common one with these motherboards, as it turns out. One of the reasons I had to boot into Ubuntu was because the system wasn't detecting any hard drives, no matter what I did or how I arranged them. I needed to make sure the system was still capable of booting. A quick visit to Google showed that these motherboards were susceptible to failing SATA controllers within the chipset, meaning that many of these systems would just spontaneously stop detecting hard drives. So, a trip to Micro Center and a few hours later, I got my hands on this IOCrest SATA controller card for just $20. I won't be adding this to the final cost of the system, since there was an unexpected troubleshooting issue, but this still leaves our new gaming system with a pretty good value. And somehow, the little thing worked. Uh, the guys at Micro Center said this card supporting the native command queue was what allowed this thing to work, but honestly, I'm not sure if what they said was legit or not. But somehow, this bit of troubleshooting worked out nicely for me. You could say it was a nice experience. Okay, so we're finally ready to get into the benchmarks. In the past, I've listed all the games I'll be testing beforehand, but this time I find it most beneficial to simply go through everything in order, as I'll be running more games than I'm used to. First up is the predictable Cinebench R15, in which the CPU earned an average multi-core score of 249, and a single core score of 63. The Core 2 Quad Q9505 scored an average of 298, and a single core score of 71 in a previous video so we clearly see that the AMD processor is missing a bit in terms of gaming performance. That said, at stock settings, it's not terribly off from the Core 2 Quad, and knowing that I've gamed on that one for a while now, it's looking like the old AMD processor still has a bit of life left in it. Passmark CPU Mark gives us an overall system score of 3229, and a score of 989 for the single-threaded test. Once again, comparing this to the Q9505, we see that the Intel processor has better single-threaded performance, with an overall score of 3445 and a single-threaded score of 1208. So what we see from synthetic CPU tests is that the Athlon 2 X4 630 has some punch behind it, but it's still not as much as the comparable Intel processors. But the reason we built this thing was to test gaming performance, so how does it handle that? Let's test Rise of the Tomb Raider first to find out. The system scored an average frame rate of 47 during the test, with a minimum frame rate of 14 FPS. This is pretty standard for what I'm used to with the benchmark, but it's important to note that during the test, many of the game assets failed to load into place, such as the wooden structures in the Geothermal Valley section. This weak CPU performance can be a big turnoff for someone wanting to play fast-paced AAA titles, though thankfully the GTX 1050 pulls its own weight. We were able to get all the way up to 1080p and high settings in this title, though going higher required more VRAM than the graphics card had in it. This is a recurring theme that we'll continue to see in the following benchmarks. Next up, we have a new title for me, which is GTA 5. Once again, we saw the CPU pegged at 100% usage the entire time, but that did mean we got to increase the graphical details without too much performance degradation. Going all the way to 1080p and high settings netted us an average frame rate of 43 FPS and a low frame rate of 21. The low frame rate occurred only in the busiest areas, however this was in no way limiting to the game performance and everything was completely playable throughout the entire experience. CSGO performed nicely, with the CPU staying pretty high on its usage the entire time. Using 1080p medium settings with 2x MSAA on gave us an average frame rate of 57 and a low frame rate of 31. This was totally playable and was an overall enjoyable experience, though for someone who is looking to get into fast-paced esports titles, it may be better to go for a system with a stronger CPU as this is the weak link preventing us from achieving a higher FPS. Team Fortress 2 tells a similar story, with an average FPS of 48 and a low FPS of 20 when tested at 1080p and high settings. 
Much like the previous titles, this gaming experience is certainly playable, but the weak CPU prevents us from achieving higher frame rates and frame times. This means that your reaction abilities may be reduced. So just to see how low we could go with the CPU, I decided to test Minecraft at 1080p and fancy graphics settings. Using 12 chunks for the render distance, we scored an average FPS of 164, which isn't much of a surprise. However, the low frame rate coming in at 21 was a surprise. Evidently, the CPU can get pretty taxed by Minecraft from time to time, as moving quickly generates a lot of new chunks all at once. This did not make the gaming experience unplayable by any means, but it did cause some undesirable stutter when moving in between areas. So the benchmarks we've seen today have shown us that this system is more than capable of playing some decent games for a pretty respectable cost. At just $120, or $140 if you include the SATA card, we were able to achieve about 40 to 50 FPS in the titles we tested. But we also saw that there is a pretty obvious weak link in the system. That would be the CPU. That's not to say that the AMD processor isn't capable, but an upgraded processor could see big performance jumps by allowing the GTX 1050 to flex its muscles a bit more. I had a really great time troubleshooting for once in my life as well. Granted, it took me two weeks to get this project done due to sickness and unexpected motherboard issues, but at the end of the day, I think this was a very illuminating project that helped open up a lot of ideas to me. I think one of the most interesting things to me was what a system at this price point was capable of, and now that I have access to this AMD platform, it's entirely possible I may choose to add a Phenom 2 processor and see if it appreciably increases gaming performance. That's a possible future video topic you may see from me. So, that's going to do it for today, guys. If you liked or disliked this video, you know what to do. If perchance you enjoy this content, or if you're just excited to see what other things I have coming up, please, subscribe to my channel. It helps me out in more ways than one, and helps you get a nice dosage of budget computer content. That's a win-win. But for now, I think I'll be going. Until next week, I'll be seeing you guys. Thank you very much for watching.